sci-fi video games are about as old as video games themselves, but all too often these games will give us spaceship fights and laser swords and grand cosmic adventures. <sighs> oh, am I right? Enter Lethal Company which delivers the true sci-fi experience that we gamers have been clamoring for. That one scene from Star Wars with the one quarter portion guy. For anyone who's been living under a rock these past few months, Lethal Company is a new survival horror game where you and up to three friends have to take the role of Scrapper as you travel to abandoned factories on distant moons in search of loot to bring back to the company, aka Ankar Plut in a box. It's genuinely some of the most fun I've had with a new game in a long time, and it's undeniable proof that it's impossible to have a true horror game that's co-op in all the best ways. Be the case. Oh my god. <laughs> there are eight different moons you can travel to in the game, each one with its own layout to explore, loot to find, and monsters to hunt you in Looney Tune-esque shenanigans. But if every moon is different, then surely that must mean that one moon is better than the rest. Well, I'm glad to say that the company has seen fit to promote me from a lowly scrapper to the role of data analyst. I've done the math, I've crunched the numbers, and today I have the answer. Today, we find out which lethal company moon is statistically the best and which one is the worst. I mean, we're really just gonna rank all the moons in order from worst to best, but that's not as snappy of a title. You get it. Richard, hit that intro. First, a huge thanks to my friend Icy Richard who helped me get this footage for this video. A link to his channel is in the description down below. He's super funny, he streams this game a lot, it's great. And for those wondering, uh, no, Icy Richard and my editor Richard are not the same person, they're just both named Richard. I refuse to play this game with editor Richard anymore ever since that time that he abandoned me against those two coil heads. No, I'm not over it, Richard. We're supposed to be a team. So for those who aren't familiar or just need a refresher, there are currently eight moons in Lethal Company. Experimentation, Assurance, and Vow are the three easy moons. In general, they've got less stuff to find, but also less monsters to contend with. Offense and March are both listed as medium difficulty, though, Let's be honest, the march is super easy. It's great. The door to the factory is a straight shot from the back of the ship. It's super quick to bring all your stuff back. It's the best. Whenever me and my friends are playing, we're always like, hmm, now where should we go? Oh yeah, march. All my homies love march. I mean, I haven't done any of the actual math yet, but I'm a thousand percent sure that march is gonna win. And lastly, there are three hard moons, Rend, Dine, and Titan. And can I just say, the fact that March is only one notch easier than the moons covered in a constant blizzard with tons of dogs and nutcrackers with guns is wild. Now you may think that the more difficult the moon, the better the loot, but looking at the data, that's not always true. The Lethal Company wiki has these tables with all of the possible loot that can spawn in each moon and how much each piece of loot is worth. So my first thought was to just find the average value of all the loot in each moon by taking the weighted average. If you simply multiply the average value of each piece of loot by its percent chance that it has to spawn, then add them all together, you can find the average value for each piece of loot that you take back. So as an example, doing this on experimentation, you'll find that the average loot value is $30. Sure, more common items like the metal sheets are worth significantly less, but there are rarer items like the cash register that are worth a lot more. So given an infinite amount of time, you can expect to make $30 per item you bring back. If you do this for every moon, then you'll find that Rend is the best, but there's one problem. 
We don't have an infinite amount of time. In this game, you've only got three days to gather enough loot to meet your quota, and if you don't have enough by then, then the company is, well, they're actually super understanding. Hey, we all have some off days. Let's just take this as a learning experience and do better next time. Don't sweat it. Coincidentally, and totally unrelated to that, I mean, you might be experiencing some problems with your ship's airlock as soon as you leave the planet and get sucked into the cold vacuum of space for your failures, again, purely coincidental. This detail is very important. That cash register on experimentation only has a 0.49% chance to spawn every time you visit. Given an infinite amount of time, yeah, you can expect to find one every once in a while to offset the cheaper metal sheets, but over just a three day period, odds are you'll never find one. You'll end up with nothing but metal sheets, and then your airlock might start having some problems. Again, purely coincidental. Knowing this, the average value of all the loot in a moon isn't actually that helpful. What we're really interested in is the average value of all the loot that you can reliably find in a three day period. So it's time to bust out some math. What we need is the probability of finding at least one of something in a cycle. To do this, we can simply do one minus the probability of not finding any of that thing. This actually works for anything when you're trying to find the probability of something happening at least once. One as a percentage is 100%, and if you subtract the probability of something not happening, then you're left with the probability of it happening, however many times that is. So for our specific case, let's define our setup a little more. Let's assume that you have a crew of four people, three of which are going out to look for loot, and one is staying behind on comms so they can guide the people inside towards the loot and away from enemies. For the three people going inside, you have four available inventory slots in the game, but let's assume that each person has one slot occupied by an item, a walkie-talkie, a flashlight, a shovel if you're feeling frisky. So with three inventory slots across three people over three days, that's a total of 27 opportunities to get items per cycle. You could technically do more than that if you did multiple trips in a day, but there will also be times when you can't find enough loot to fill up every slot before it gets too late, so this is an average. This is also assuming that everyone survives long enough to fill up all their slots, but don't worry, we'll come back to that later. So in an ideal cycle, you can get 27 items. Let's assume for simplicity's sake that you just get the first 27 items you find, and then you leave. The table contains the probability of each item spawning, so the odds of never finding any across those 27 opportunities is the percent chance that it doesn't spawn raised to the power of the number of chances you have to find it. In our case, 27. And then to find the probability of finding at least one, you just need to subtract that value from one. So the final equation will look something like this. So as an example, a metal sheet has a 14.36% chance to spawn per visit. So the odds of finding at least one over three days is 98.5. Yeah, that checks out. So let's add a new column to our table with this value and call it the reliability. If the reliability of an item is more than 50%, that means that you are more likely to find at least one of these items than not in a typical cycle. If it's less than 50% though, that means that you are more likely to never come across one in a cycle, which makes them unreliable. Since we're looking for which moon is reliably the most profitable, we're gonna dump these. They're a nice bonus if you can find them, but if you don't, that airlock's looking real sketchy. That's all I'm saying, that's all I'm saying, just a coincidence. Of the items remaining, we need to recalculate their rarity, then we can take the weighted average of those by multiplying the new relative rarity by the average cost and taking the sum, and now we have the average value of all the loot that you can 
reliably fine on each moon. Great. Are we done? Of course we're not done. Man, I'm starting to think those scrappers had the easier job. As I'm sure you've noticed by now, all these calculations are based on the assumption that everyone makes it back to the ship with a full inventory. But as anyone who's played the game before knows, sometimes your partner, oh, I don't know, sacrifices you to a group of coil heads, even though you had a perfect plan to escape together, Richard. No, no, I'm not gonna stop talking about it, you son of a bitch. In an ideal world, sure, getting a full inventory every single time would be great, but more often than not, that's absolutely not happening. For starters, you don't have all day to find loot. Well, well, no, technically you do have all day, but the days in this game are deceptively short. Sometimes you're wandering around deep in the bowels of March, yelling at your comms person to lead you to some loot, but there's just none around, and at some point, you gotta cut your losses and head back. This is due to something called loot density. Every moon has a maximum and minimum number of items that it can possibly spawn. So experimentation can have anywhere from 8 to 12 pieces of scrap to find, while Titan can have 23 to 38. In addition to that, some maps are physically larger than others, defined by a value called the Map Scale Multiplier. Assurance and experimentation are both the standard map size, and something like Dine is 1.3 times larger than that. So, to find the loot density, we need to take the average number of scrap that can spawn and divide that by the map size multiplier. This will give you the number of items that will spawn per standard map size. In other words, the higher the density, the easier it is to find stuff. To turn this into a more useful form, let's make it a percentage by finding the highest density value across all the moons, in this case, Dine at 18.46, and divide everything by that number. So if there was no danger at all, you could find around five items on Vow in the same time it took you to find nine on Dine. But of course, there is danger. There's always danger. Danger around every corner. There's danger right there. Ah! <laughs> it's chasing me. And obviously, you can't bring back any loot if you're dead. This one's a bit more challenging to quantify because it's totally dependent on the skill of your crew. Some more fledgling crews will struggle on even the earliest moons, while seasoned professionals are like, yeah, yeah, I'll go into an eclipse red totally on my own with no items, no flashlight, no walking, no nothing. This ain't my first rodeo. I'll be fine. Spoilers. It wasn't fine. To keep this calculation as objective as possible, I've decided to convert each moon's official risk level into a percent chance of survival, where a D is 80%, a C is 70, B is 60, and so on to S plus at a mere 30%. I'm assuming here that the chance of survival for each person is independent of one another. You could make the argument that if one person dies, it's a cue to everyone else to get out of there ASAP, but there's an equally likely chance that your friend bludgeons you to death with a stop sign when he's trying to kill a loot bug, and then you both die, so I think it evens out. As a note, I'm not including weather at all in this calculation because you have some degree of control over which weather types you want to engage with. If a moon is stormy, it doesn't matter how good the loot is, you're probably gonna wanna steer clear of it, so you know, this doesn't happen. Oh, <laughs> oh my god. And now you could make the argument that we should include weather for the harder moons because you need to pay a fee to get to them, and once you're there, you're kinda stuck with your decision, even if it is eclipsed. The survival rates that I've used are just general guesses. So to compensate, I've included a link to this spreadsheet that I've been using to make all these calculations in the description down below with the survival rate column highlighted in green. If you want something a bit more 
personal to your group, then try keeping track of how often you die on each moon and use that to change this column yourself. The sheet is set up in a way that it will automatically update the rest for you. So now we have the average value of loot that you can reliably find on each moon, the ease of which you can find that loot, and the odds of you living long enough to actually bring that loot back, but there's still one problem. Lots of the most valuable loot, especially on the earlier moons, are two-handed items, meaning that once you pick one up, you can't pick up anything else. Sure, you could drop it to grab another one-hander and then pick it back up, but you can never carry more than one two-handed item at once. So really, we need to split this data in two to find the average value of the one-handed scrap items versus two-handed. Let's assume that on an ideal trip, you get two one-handed scrap and one two-handed item. Uh, true, you could leave an extra two-handed item outside the door to make more space and come back for it, but you could also never find a two-handed item and fill up on just one-handed items instead, so this is just the average scenario. <sighs> So, to find the expected value of the loot that you can reliably find and actually carry, you would add twice the average value of the one-handed items to the average value of one two-handed item. That's how much each person could carry back on average. If we multiply that by the loot density percentage, the odds of actually finding that loot, and then multiply that by the survival chance, the odds of actually bringing it all back to the ship, and then multiply that by the three people going in, then you can find how much money you can expect to find per day on each moon. Let's run them all down, shall we? Starting from the bottom, experimentation is statistically the worst moon in the game. No surprise there, it's basically just the tutorial moon. It's not that dangerous, but the average value of loot is pretty low, and it can only spawn 8 to 12 items, so there's a very real chance that you could loot the whole factory, never encounter any danger, and still not fill up all 9 slots. Just barely ahead of experimentation, the second worst moon in the game is, believe it or not, my beloved March. Yeah, I know, I know, I didn't believe in myself, but it turns out my crew has been messing up real bad. Here's an honest recreation of my reaction seeing this. All right, let's crunch some numbers real quick. Show me March. <gasps> no! For starters, despite the fact that it's a higher tier difficulty, the loot there is not that much more valuable than easier moons like Vow or Assurance. But the real issue with March is its density. It's the second largest map in the game, literally twice the size of Assurance or Experimentation, but it can only spawn 13 to 17 items. So you're probably gonna spend a lot of time aimlessly wandering around corridors. That's probably why the walk back from the ship to the door is so short. They know you're gonna have to run a freaking marathon just to get out of the place. Right above that is Titan. It's the most dangerous moon by a lot, so obviously your chances of dying are significantly higher. But even if you're great at the game and never die, the loot there is just straight up worse than the other Hard Moon brothers. Admittedly, the walk from the door to the ship is pretty easy. Unless, of course, a dog decides to see what these cool stairs are up with. Oh, what are these? And then you're pretty much screwed. So if you're gonna shell out the cash to go to one of the further moons, skip Titan. Offense and Vow are both pretty similar right in the middle. Vow is a bit easier in terms of enemies, but offense has a bit more loot to find, so it's really up to you which one you'd rather go to. But yeah, they're both just fine. Starting off the top three, I'll be honest, I can never tell the difference between Dine and Rend. They're both super snowy planets with weird mansion interiors, but it turns out there is one key difference between the two. Dine is objectively worse in just about every single metric imaginable. 
Second place is shockingly listed as one of the easiest moons in the game. It's Assurance. Yeah, yeah, I was shocked myself. All my homies hate Assurance. Team March till we die. But it turns out we were dummies. True, the loot there isn't nearly as valuable as the hard moons, but it's easily on par with the two medium ones. The real kicker with Assurance though is the loot density. The map is half the size of March, and yet it has the exact same loot range. You'll practically be tripping over loot here. Even if you don't include danger as a factor at all, there's really no reason to go to either medium moon over assurance. It's strictly better. And finally, in first place, the statistically best moon in the game is Rend. And honestly, it's not even that close. The loot there is a shade more valuable than the rest, it's one of the most densely packed maps in the game, and according to the game's risk levels at least, it's less dangerous than Dine. Don't know where they're getting that from, they both seem exactly the same to me, but sure. If you're feeling confident in your ability to survive, then Rend is your best bet. So in summary, the ideal strategy for this game is to head to Assurance early game basically every time. If the weather is bad, you could do a day in Vow or Offense instead, but steer clear of experimentation and March as much as I hate to admit it. Once you've gotten enough money to pay the entrance fee, head over to Rend. As long as you bring back four to five items per day, you'll be sitting pretty. Of course, the real truth is that no matter how well you do, that quota is going to keep going up. No matter what you do, there's going to come a time when you just can't bring back enough. And when that time comes, well, the company would like to wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. Oh, and uh, I forgot to mention, you might want to check on that airlock of yours. Welcome to our A massive thank you to everyone who supports me on Patreon, including Alakazam, Ethan Ferlano, Sherry and Mark, Starjoy, Big Dog Tie, For to Win, The Boss Killer 94, and Audenberg Freud and Zilligan. Bet you didn't think I'd be able to pronounce that last one, did ya? And maybe I didn't, I don't know. 